I'm Kay Lemon, Executive Director at the Marketing Science Institute. As many of you know, since 1961, nonprofit MSI has been the bridge between marketing theory and business practice. We fund research by leading academics worldwide on topics voted uh, on by our 70 plus corporate sponsors, and we disseminate results through members only events and a variety of publications. I'm very pleased to welcome you to another MSI for members by members webinar. This is a series of webinars on subjects related to our current research priority topics. First, I'd like to point out the chat with presenter function in the left hand corner of your screen. Please use this feature to send through any questions you have for Dave during the presentation. We'll gather the questions and have a brief Q&A session following the presentation. Also, Dave's slides as well as the entire webinar will be available for download on the MSI member website. Now I'd like to introduce you to today's featured speaker. David Ocker of University of California, Berkeley has kindly agreed to present today's webinar on three branding trends you need to know. David Ocker is Vice Chairman of Profit Brand Strategy and Professor Emeritus of Marketing Strategy at the University of California, Berkeley Haas School of Business. He's the winner of four career awards for contributions to the practice and science of marketing, the most recent being named to the Marketing Hall of Fame by the NYAMA. He's published over 100 articles and 17 books that have sold well over a million copies and includes strategic market management, building strong brands, brand leadership, brand portfolio strategy, from Fargo to the world of brands, spanning silos, brand relevance, and his latest book, Ocker on Branding. Dave has won awards for the best article in the California Management Review and twice in the Journal of Marketing. A recognized authority on brand strategy, he's been an active consultant and speaker throughout the world. A columnist for AMA's Marketing News, he regularly blogs at davidocker.com and on LinkedIn. Dave is also a fellow Cal Bear, and I'm thrilled with that, and has been a great mentor to me. Uh, Dave, welcome to MSI. Thank you. Uh, it's good to be here. Um, just some background. I uh, sort of tried to pull together my ideas that appeared in, in books and articles and blogs and so on and uh, to sort of maybe 40 concepts organized into 20 principles. And that uh, became a very compact way to present a lot of my ideas. And uh, uh, so I, I sort of sat back and said, oh, okay, out of that material, what really are the most important, the most impactful uh, uh, ideas or trends that, that are represented there? And, uh, and I picked out three. And so that's what we're going to talk about. And incidentally, if anybody who's uh, involved in the webinar would like a copy of my book and doesn't have one, uh, especially if you're really active in social media, please send me an email with your address and I'll get you a copy. Um, so uh, let's look at the, at the first of these three trends. And that is that um, um, I, I see a, a, a shift from my brand is better than your brand competition to subcategory competition. I think it's, it's based upon the, uh, the fast paced of innovation and a, and a recognition that growth really is caused when, when you develop a must have that defines a whole new subcategory. There's a lot of evidence for that, but uh, the insight really came to me when I analyzed some Japanese beer data. I had data that really extended over 35 or 40 years, and what you saw in that data was remarkable momentum. A lot of marketing uh, new product activity, a lot of marketing advertising committee didn't change the, the, the trajectory of market share at all. What you saw in these uh, 35 years of data is market share trajectory only changed four times. Three of those times, there was a whole new subcategory form that drives the change, Super Dry, Karen Ichiban, and, uh, and the, in the time in which Hapashu, a low-tax, low-malt beer, got traction. 
The fourth time was when two subcategories were simultaneously uh, repositioned, logger and super dot dry. So 45 years of data and all the major changes in market share trajectory can be uh, explained by subcategory competition. If you look at uh, any category and you find the same thing, computers, financial services, water, cars, uh, hotels, uh, yogurt, you, if you look at it for an extended period of time, you know, 5, tw uh, 10, 20 years, you'll see that it, the only time you saw a, a real growth in sales or market share from a brand, there was a subcategory explanation. Uh, it's, it's really quite remarkable. So I really concluded that with rare exceptions, the only time you see growth is when there's a new subcategory formed. So that suggests there's, a, there's two routes to winning. One is a conventional route that most people follow. My brand is better than your brand. And uh, in some defined category, and you win when con con competitors are not preferred. Competition is, is basically uh, based not only on your brand, my brand is better than your brand marketing, but also on incremental innovation. The other route to winning is to create a must-have which defines a whole new subcategory. Winning is then when competitors are not even considered. Uh, they're not relevant. They're not in the consideration set. And, and competition is based in large part on big innovation, not inter incremental innovation. It's very different. You look at Toyota Corolla, and, and they're competing with <coughs> Honda, Chevrolet, and Ford, it's brutal, so not fun. But you look at uh, Prius that's really enjoyed 15 years of, uh, of with very, with no or weak competition. They've sold 3 million vehicles. They still own 61% of market share in the world. Um, and uh, you look at uh, Chrysler minivan, which uh, sold 13 uh, million copy or, or vehicles over a time frame when uh, there was really no competition. Look at Enterprise uh, uh, Rent-A-Car. All of these cases where you see spurts in, of growth really occurred when a new subcategory was uh, invented. So how do you win the subcategory game? Well, one approach is to Reframe the subcategory. Own it and reframe it. If you look at uh, the Pampers case in, in China, in 2007, they really got a, the product right. But the, they found the customers weren't really interested in what they were selling. They were not interested in dryness and convenience. But they were interested in the quality of their baby's sleep. Pampers did a study which uh, showed that uh, if, a, if, if a probability, a uh, random sample of mothers used Pampers, their babies went to sleep faster, they slept 30 minutes more, and they had 50% less distraction. So Pampers developed a golden sleep campaign, which was all about sound sleep, sound development. They had people submit pictures of baby sleeping can you imagine what could be better than baby sleeping? Um, visually, they got uh, uh, 100,000 entries. And, uh, and then they succeeded in changing what people were buying. They, ch successed in, they changed the whole category from a category that delivered dryness and convenience to a category that delivered better sleep for their babies. 2012, dis disposable diaper sales in China were over $3 billion worth, up from practically zero in 2007. Another way is to create a must-have that defines a new subcategory. You know, take, uh, for example, Luna, who in uh, 1999 entered the energy bar category that was exclusively uh, served by energy bars that were heavy, large, sticky, and, and formulated for men. So they came out with an energy bar for women. 
had lemon supplements in it. It was light and crunchy. It had flavors like lemon zest and chai tea. And uh, uh, Luna followed this up with a, a nutritional drink, a protein bar. Uh, they have a women's films festival around Luna. They have a pro biking team uh, around Luna. So they, uh, is this is not really a technical breakthrough, just an insight that there was a, a subcategory, namely energy bars for women, that was uh, uh, an opportunity. And finally, you, you, to win the subcategory game, you've got to prevent competitors from being considered. And there's a lot of ways to do that. I, I, I wrote a book called Brand Relevance that describes this in a lot more detail. But one of the ways to do that is to brand your innovation. And uh, Uniqlo, one of the in, uh, amazing success stories in retailing today, uh, and if you're in New York or, or uh, you've got to go and visit their, their, uh, their, their signature store in the middle of Manhattan. But one of the reasons that Uniqlo has, uh, has really been such a phenomenal success is they have about, they have about five or six must-haves, but one of them is their ability to innovate clothing. And they branded the innovation, heat tech. This is a heat generating clothing that will convert moisture, a body moisture into heat and keep it there. It uh, actually creates heat to warm you up and keep you warm. And they branded it. You know, there's, there's all these major outdoor clothing companies, you know, Nike uh, uh, and, and, and the others have come out with similar competitive fabrics, but they don't have heat tech because that's branded. So that's a way to protect and own the subcategory you create. So let me turn to a second trend. Um, and that is what I call sweet spot communication. If you look at what you really want to communicate in any kind of brand building or communication program, you want to gain visibility for your brand. You want to give it to energy. Energy is one of the, the key elements of brand now. And if, if you look at the, uh, uh, the YNR, uh, big database, they, they really show that energy is declining and, and, and with that brand. You want to create a relationship beyond transactions. You want to be liked. And the holy grail these days, you want to be a social media player. So what do we do? We, we uh, design communication programs that, that elevate our offering, our brand, and our firm. It's all about me, me, me. But tragically, customers are simply not interested these days in your offer, in your brand, in your firm. So you spend all this money, and you accomplish none of these goals. So there's an alternative. It's, uh, it's, it's to look, instead of looking at uh, what you want to communicate, you look at what the customers do care about. You look at uh, the customer sweet spot. What are they interested in? What do they really care about? What are they passionate about? And what do they do? What activities? What occupies their time? And then you build a sweet spot brand building program around that with the brand as an active and interested partner. Let me give you some examples. You know, people really don't care about diapers. They just don't, but they do care about baby care. So Pampers have a love, sleep, and play, which, which is kind of a go-to source for information on babies and baby care. They have seven sections. Um, if you look at, for example, the baby development section, they have 21 articles. They have 230 forms. They have uh, 23 play and learn activities. And uh, in each of those categories, there's similar resource for uh, 
from others to come and learn and to interact. You know, people aren't so interested in farm equipment, but they are interested in baby and better farming. And that's the objective of deferral. It's a, a publication that actually started 120 years ago when John Deere had the, the insight that uh, uh, of the customer sweet spot over a century ago. So this publication has all kinds of technical in a, in a stuff. What do you do about the declining bat population? Uh, the, what do you need to know about advances in fertilizer? But it also talks about things like accounting and the rural lifestyle, things that matter to farmers. I mean, today, this quarterly publication gets over 2 million loyal readers. Uh, you know, people aren't interested in, in the uh, credit card, but if you're a small business, you are interested in American Express open form. And they've got categories like, how do you plan for growth? How do you manage your money? How do you get customers? How do you build your team? Things that small businessmen are really interested in. American Express gets uh, a million visitors a month. And just think what that does to the reputation of American Express brand, because if you're, if you're interested and knowledgeable enough to, uh, uh, to, to be involved in those topics, you're probably going to have a good uh, uh, sense in terms of, of building the products you do, do put out. California Casualty is a property and casualty insurance company, and, and boy, I can tell you, if uh, there, there's nothing that people are less interested in in learning about insurance and insurance products. California Casualty's main uh, segment is teachers and, uh, and other employees like policemen and firemen. And so what, what they have found that teachers are interested in are things like their California Casualty School Lounge Makeover program and their Impact Teen Drivers program where they teach teens about uh, distracted driving. And that's something take, uh, uh, teachers relate to and so that's something that they can go to Cal Casually and, and have a discussion. You know, Avon has uh, uh, you know, recognizes that, that to get energy, talking about their skin care and cosmetic products, and not nearly as effective as talking about the Avon Breast Cancer Crusade and their Walk for Breast Cancer. And they raised $640 million since it's been going over 20 years ago. They've educated $100 million at, uh, about breast cancer. And... Uh, uh, so this is an example of looking sort of beyond your products for something that customers are interested in. So if you do that, you can, uh, you know, you can see that it's something like take the John Deere Farrow uh, publication. Think about visibility, energy, relationships beyond transactions, become liked and respected and to be a social media player. There's things in that that people talk about, and uh, they're much more likely to do so than the um, talking about farm equipment. Just in a, an aside, that when you start talking about content, what you quickly learn is the hot topic in marketing today, stories become pretty relevant. So uh, if you take, for example, Google Earth, they have a whole series of heroes of Google Earth where they have dozens and dozens of, of stories that uh, show how people have used Google Earth to, uh, to do really big things. And uh, one story involved Dr. Julius Bayless, who is a, uh, a conservative biologist from Kew Gardens outside London. And he was hiking in Mozambique. And he saw a mountain in the distance it, uh, in, uh, uh, in Mozambique. And uh, it looked very promising as a, uh, as a biodiversity environment. Uh, and uh, so 
So he went back to Google Earth, and he basically discovered that there was a huge rainforest there. It turned out to be the largest one in South Africa, and it was unknown, undiscovered, and uh, unexplored. And uh, he ultimately found a way to explore it, and he discovered 13 new species of plants and, uh, and, and animals they hadn't even known about before. So this is a story that reflects the power of Google Earth. Now, you could talk about Google Earth's attributes all day long, but it wouldn't have the magic of a story. L.L. Bean has a story. He was a 35-year-old duck hunter, and he got uh, tired of having cold feet, the wet feet, at the end of a, a hunting expedition. So he designed some boots with leather bottoms and leather tops, rather, and rubber bottoms. And uh, uh, and if you think about that story about how he did that and how when some of them leaked, he took the, his first hundred boots back and uh, and replaced them. Even that that was a, a hard thing to do, and he ended up with boot, boots that did work. And that story really tells you so much, not only about the the boots, but about the L.L. Bean uh, passion for hunting and fishing, and which is now the passion for outdoors, and their passion for innovation. Now, if I told you about the, L, the characteristics of these boots, the seven characteristics, money-back guarantee, waterproof rubber bottom boots, and so on and so on, you'd have a hard time remembering much of that list two minutes from now or two weeks from now or two months from now. But if I tell you the, remind you of the story of L.L. L. Bean, it's a different story. It's, uh, it's more memorable because, uh, you know, you only have one thing to remember. Uh, you, you're probably more attentive to the story than you were in, in reading those lists. Um, and uh, you have a link to a lot of things in your memory. You know, you kind of know what duck hunting is. And it's more persuasive. Um, in part because there's less counter-arguing. There's study after study that have showed that if you convert facts to stories, you distract, and you don't have so many um, counter-arguing events happening. And uh, these positive feelings get transferred to the brand, and, and, uh, and, and the, the audience member is deducing the... The, the argument themselves. They're not being told. And we know that that uh, works better. Finally, uh, the, the higher purpose that exists today in branding is truly, truly remarkable. You know, there's a story about the people observing some bricklayers, and, and uh, they asked one bricklayer, what are you doing? And he said, why? Well, I'm uh, Lane Bricks, and I'm probably the best bricklayer around. I really do it well. And a second bricklayer, when asked the same question, said, I'm building a wall, and look at my wall. It's so straight and pure. And the third bricklayer was asked the same question. He said, I'm building a cathedral. So which, which set of employees are going to do the better job? Which, which uh, final building are you going to want to have, the, the one by with a bricklayer that's actually building a cathedral. A higher purpose really inspires. It inspires employees and it also can inspire uh, uh, customers. I mean, what would you rather uh, uh, buy from and, and which would you rather work for? The, the, the brand that helps parents and teachers raise inspired, creative children? or the company that wants to increase sales and profits by 15%. The company that wants to build insanely great products will be successful financially. And it's really, it's, it's just extraordinary, the, uh, the traction that higher purpose has got. In uh, 2004, the CEO of, of Walmart, Rob, Walton was on a camping trip, and he was challenged 
why don't you do something to save this environment of ours? So he really, he really got religion, and he turned Walmart into a sustainability-driven green company. It was amazing. I mean, uh, they're just slightly behind Marks and Spencer and Tesco into what they're doing in terms of sustainability. They're just amazing. They've really made a huge difference. They've got sustainability through their whole <coughs> program. And there was an article out a, a year or so ago that said, it's hard to hate Walmart anymore. <coughs> and people really did hate Walmart. But they've been able to change the conversation a little bit. No longer about their, how they're exploiting their employees and their suppliers and, their, and so forth, but uh, what they're doing for the environment. I mean, just think, Walmart, who would have thought? of all the companies. And then you have a, uh, the most amazing company uh, is Unilever, making life better. They're, they've got a sustainability living plan they started in 2010. They're going to help a billion people. They're going to one half their environmental footprint. They're going to source 100% of, of their material, raw materials uh, in, a, in a sustainability fashion. And this all in 10 years. And why? You look at the CEO, Paul Pullman, and it's just remarkable what he says. He talks about global warming, resource depletion, income gap. He asks the question, does business wait for government? Or is business part of the solution? And he says business is part of the solution. We've got to do something. It's extraordinary. Uh, MIT with uh, BCG does a study every year, and their last study with 4,000 respondents, they found that sustainability was the top priority of 65% of the firms, up from 46% in 2010. 39% have a, a public report on how they're doing. So it comes to, and from a branding point of view, what we're interested in is how do you get credit for it? And I think that you know, 90% of the people say they want to do good, and you know, probably two thirds of them do, but only a tiny, tiny percentage get credit. So how do you get credit for it? Well, I think it, it depends on two things. One, authenticity. You've got to really be you. It, it really hasn't. It can't be word, words. It's got to be tied to your mission and values. And second, you need visible programs. So let's look at a few people that have gotten um, credit for doing, um, having a higher purpose and doing the right thing. Muji is really an incredible brand. It, I've done a survey of brand strength of a hundred, of a thousand brands in Japan every year for 12 years, and Muji is always one of the top 20 brands. Muji literally stands for no brand. It's the no brand brand. It's a brand that uh, is, is, is anti-glitz, anti-prestige. Uh, they want to foster serenity, moderation, simplicity, um, and being understated. They want to cultivate the natural environment. I mean, that's them. That's their mission. That's their values. And if you look at what they do, if you go into their stores, um, you see products that do not over-deliver. They deliver quality, but enough. Um, you know, you look at, you see a lot of beige. I mean, beige is okay. Uh, you see no logos. Why would you need a logo um, in your clothing? Um, simple. And the and there's music in the store, and it's really a calming if they, a sort of feeling in those stores. And cultivate the national environment. Listen to this. They have two big parks that are pristine. I mean, it, it's like a company is running two national parks. Um, it's, it's really amazing. So you can see uh, these programs of Muji. Um, 
Asian Paints is well, was named by Hub as one of the top brands last year, and <laughs> their higher purpose is to give confidence in selecting paint. Not just having good paint, but giving confidence. And so they have an on-screen virtual room, so you can uh, you can click on a picture of your room, and you can put different colors on the wall, and you can provide a whole different look, and you can see what works, and you can get confidence in your own uh, ability to do that. One of the brands in, in that gets real credit for a higher purpose, which is to inspire and implement solutions to the environmental crisis, is Patagonia. They have their three R's program, very visible, recycle. Uh, and uh, so they, uh, they have uh, a recycling program that people can bring their clothing to a Patagonia place, and, and it will be recycled into new fabric. Repair, there's a, you can give your, your uh, garments to Patagonia, and they will repair it for you. Uh, reuse. They have a program on eBay by which they can, uh, you can sell or donate or trade your used articles. So it's, they're re reused. And reduce. They actually encourage people not to buy their new product. They ran an ad, don't buy this jacket, because it uses a lot of water to make. Um, and in, uh, in Unilever, it's got a particular problem because Unilever doesn't have any customer-facing brands. So how can they get credit for what they do? Well, their, their basic philosophy uh, is permeated into their brands, and they encourage that. And so Lifebuoy has a hand-washing program, and they've saved lives by getting uh, millions of people to wash their hands. And the Dove Self-Esteem Fund is, is an amazing way to provide confidence for young girls. Uh, and Nora Soup has the World Food Day, and they make a major effort to feed or to make hunger a less of a problem in the world. So again, these are visi visible programs that the, the uh, Unilever brand has, and, and these programs, a lot of them wouldn't exist if it wasn't for the Unilever Making Life Better basic mission. And higher purpose win. Now, this is some, a correlational study. It's not a causation study, but two firms have made, two books or sets of authors have made efforts to identify higher purpose firms. Uh, Jay Sheth and, and two of his, his co-authors have got firms of endearment, they identified 43 higher purpose firms, and in 10 years, these firms did eight times better than the S&P. Jim Stengel developed uh, the, in this Grow book had 50 higher purpose firms, 10 years, they did four times better than S&P. Now they didn't, it's, it's, it's probably true that they didn't do it because uh, of their higher purpose uh, mission and programs, but what it does say is people that are inclined in that direction, um, they don't, they're not going to sacrifice that much financially. In fact, the, 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 the emphasis that gets them to do that will get them to be smart managers and developing customer relationships, and they'll end up with higher performance. So anyway, that's three trends from uh, uh, brand to subcategory competition. It's no longer just about my brand is better than your brand. If you really want to grow, you need to develop must-haves that define new subcategories, and then you have to make sure those subcategories win and that you own them. Sweet spot, spot communication. It's not about communicating your offering, your brand, your firm. It's about finding what customers are interested in, what customers do, and building a, a brand building program around that and becoming an active partner. And I think that all brands now have to start looking to see whether higher purpose makes sense for them. And uh, in, in finding a purpose that will inspire uh, employees, that will inspire customers, 
and that will make a difference in the world and it will really do something effective and that it will move beyond um, just words. I, I, if, for some of those that came in late, I, I uh, said that I would be glad to send a book to anybody that emailed me with their shipping address. It's docker at profit.com, P-R-O-P-H-E-T. And, um, and in the book, you'll find a lot more about these, uh, these three trends and some others. Um, so anyway, uh, thanks for joining me. And we'll have some time for some Q&A. I look forward to that. Hi, Dave. Um, thank you so much. That, that was great. And we have several questions that have uh, uh, been populated and sent. I want to remember the, remind the audience to send questions directly through the chat with presenter function in the left-hand corner of your screen. And we'll try to get as, to as many as we can. The first question, um, Dave, that kind of addresses uh, several of the strategies that you talked about relates to um, subcategory inconsistencies in company brands. And the question is, you know, what happens when you're promoting one value with one subcategory brand and a different value system for another subcategory brand or a different story or a different higher purpose that perhaps is inconsistent? What are your thoughts on that? Well, I, I think that um, a brand is you know, has its own uh, organizational values in its own organization, in fact. So I think that uh, it, it gets into the basic portfolio decision about how does your, your brand vision uh, change over different contexts. Now, if, if, so if you have a, a brand like, uh, like IBM that's in the business area, uh, where it's in high tech, it's in pharmaceuticals, and so on. It might take a little different uh, uh, slant in each of those. Some of their brand vision elements might be interpreted differently. They might add some brand uh, elements in in one case. So, so um, that's a, a problem we've dealt with for a long time. How do you modify a brand in different contexts or different countries? But if you have different brands. Like uh, Unilever has Dove in, in one context, and they have uh, uh, other brands in different contexts that, that are inconsistent. I mean, I, I don't think that's an a issue. I mean, it's, it's, not the Unilever, it's not the Unilever program. It's the Dove program, and it's the, or it's the Axe program. And uh, I, I think that uh, – uh, the Dove has its own values, its own mission, its own organization, and so does Axe. And I think they can go in different directions, and they don't have to be consistent. Okay, great. That, thank you. Uh, a related question, for, you know, when you're kind of thinking of that whole uh, house of brands, with, within, within subcategory branding, how does a master brand determine the right number of sub-brands? You know, is, is it, do you get to a point where you've then got too many? Um, or can you just keep adding these, these uh, sub-brands and sub-categories um, uh, infinitely? Or, or do you have a sense of kind of how broadly you can, how, how many you can do and how far you can stretch? Well, I, I wrote a book, Brand Portfolio Strategy, that addressed that question and similar ones. And, and the reality is that if if uh, if you want to develop a, a brand vision um, that will guide the brand, it, it it's kind of a there's a linear way to do that. We know how to do that. You find out about the uh, the brand, you find out about the audience, you you uh, find out some ideas that you want to stand for. You you organize them into groups and you implement them. It's a very linear process. Brand portfolio strategy, you know, how many sub-brands, which sub-brands, which endorsed brands, and when when you need a new brand, uh, when can, when you use a descriptor, uh, those questions are really messy, and they're tied up with a with a business strategy going forward, which is often not clear, and uh, and and so there's no no linear sort of turn the crank method and there's no 
there's no answers to questions like that. You, it's just also idiosyncratic to the context. Well, and, I, uh, yeah, I appreciate this notion that you know some things shouldn't be easy, right? Some things really just require some work. Um, kind of taking we this. Thank for that. Otherwise, they wouldn't pay us all this big bucks. I mean, if it was easy and linear. That's right. All of us on the call wouldn't have jobs. Right. So, kind of um, uh, going in a slightly different direction, there was a question about whether the approaches that you've talked about today, the sweet spot communications and the higher purpose, um, will work equally well to luxury goods, say, versus commoditized goods or services. Um, yeah, yes, I do. I think so. Uh, I mean, um, well, uh, you know, take, for example, the uh, the John Deere Farrell magazine. I mean, John Deere, I guess, is not really a commodity, but if you had, uh, if you were a Monsanto and selling fertilizer, which is a bit of a commodity, you know, I would think your audience would be similar. They were interested in rural lifestyle. They're interested in accounting for their, how do you do accounting well if you're managing a farm? And how do you know about uh, weather and, and so on? And uh, uh, in fact, uh, Monsanto has a, a whole initiative around weather and helping farmers with weather. And, and uh, so that's an example of a commodity product that is looking at, you know, what really are our customers interested in, and one answer is weather, and they're really actively doing something about that. And so, yeah, I think that for a commodity product, it's even more important to, uh, uh, you know, look to the customer's sweet spot instead of trying to talk about your offering your brand or your firm. And on the, the higher purpose piece, do you think that the higher purpose works for real luxury goods and services, uh, high-end cruises and, and the Rolexes and the Hermes of, of the world? Can, is, that, is that still authentic? Yeah, I think so. I, well, I, mean, I think that's a good question. I think it needs to be authentic. Yeah. And you don't want to have a higher purpose just to have a higher purpose. It, it really needs to be uh, authentic. It needs to be linked to your mission and values in, in your culture, and it needs to be uh, supported by visible programs. Um, but, uh, yeah, I think that any brand and any organization should consider whether a higher purpose is important to them. And if you're a luxury brand, I, I would think that that's kind of the definition of luxury. There is a uh, a higher purpose. Great, and you know exactly some of these things we were talking about. There was a related question um, talking about how do you handle you know in today's world consumer suspicion and distrust toward company higher purpose aims. And someone else asked um, when you think about some of these uh, brands that have had high profile failures or you know. Um, say, uh, disasters in the environment, does a failure of authenticity cost you more than trying to have a higher purpose in the first place? What are your thoughts on kind of that distrust when you lose trust with the consumer? Yeah, what's the rule of thumb? A, a negative um, a, a incident or, or communication is five times more impactful than a positive one. It um, yeah, that's that's a that's a big risk, and it all comes down to authenticity and, and substance. Uh, that's another concept. You know, do you have substance? Are you really investing behind it? Do you have measurable goals? Do you have uh, programs, visible programs internally and externally? And um, if those are in place, then I think that you're going to uh, not only uh, avoid difficulties, but you are going to engender trust, and, and you are going to create trust. And a lot of people think trust is one of the uh, most, most important brand elements. I, 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 would, I would think it's close behind energy, but um, uh, trust is, is kind of table stakes. And, and if you do all those things in the higher purpose context, you're going to engender and enhance trust. 
Well, great. And you just mentioned brand energy. We had a question um, where someone wanted you to speak a little bit more about that. What is brand energy and how can we best measure it? Uh, good question. I think that, uh, you know, I talk about energy uh, uh, a lot. And uh, energy is, uh, well, it's first of all involvement. Um, it's uh, if if you get involved, that's a, that's a, one of the best sources of energy. It's uh, it's innovation. So if it's a new product, you have new things happening in your product that are meaningful. That's energy. Um, it's uh, uh, it it has to do with visibility and excitement. If you have something that uh, a personality that's exciting, that's a source of energy. So. There's a lot of different dimensions to energy, a lot of routes to getting energy. I mean, they, uh, I talk in, in, in relevance about, relevance is all about being considered. It's, uh, and, and half of being considered is, is visibility, and that's energy. So uh, if you look at the, the Republican presidential thing, Trump is doing well because he's got energy and visibility. The second part of, of relevance is is, uh, is is believing that you have the is credibility that you can do whatever the job is. So it's visibility and credibility, but uh, but energy is is driving the visibility part. Well, great. Um, we also had a question that uh, related to when you were talking about sweet spot communications and higher purpose. Uh, someone raised the question that uh, suggestions of going in that direction, particularly a higher purpose and a sweet spot as well, are, are sometimes objected to as being too general to be closely associated with our brand. So, you know, they're, they're kind of just too broad an approach or a positioning to really be tightly, appropriately associated with the brand. So when you think about kind of identifying that customer sweet spot, or identifying what that higher purpose is, if you want to go to either of those directions. How concrete or abstract should you be, or kind of how narrow or broad should you be so that it really uh, does resonate and make a difference and actually make something happen? Well, if you look at the sweet spot stuff, there's a spectrum. The, the brand can be an integral part of the, of the sweet spot. So example, Kaiser Hospitals have a, uh, you know, Make Yourself Healthy, basically, program. And uh, it's kind of integrated into what Kaiser does. So it's, it's really closely associated. At the other end of the spectrum, look at Avon, a Walk for Breast Cancer. I mean, Avon, Walking for Breast Cancer has nothing to do with any of their products. It's completely divorced. But, uh, it's, uh, but Avon has branded it. Avon has run it for 25 years almost, and so as a result, they got a lot of energy because nobody, you know, nobody, there's nobody that doesn't know that Walk for Breast Cancer is Avon, and uh, nobody doesn't believe that Avon cares about women's breast cancer, and so uh, uh, you, you don't necessarily have to have it tightly uh, involved with your your program. Um, but usually, if it's to be effective, it's better if you can utilize the assets and skills of your organization, and so there is some connection. But uh, it doesn't necessarily have to be there. Cool. So, so um, going back to the, the first thing you talked about in terms of uh, creating a new subcategory, uh, a question was raised by uh, one of our attendees about how do you decide whether to do more of a repositioning of a product or actually create a new subcategory? Can you kind of talk about under which conditions you'd recognize you should say you should do which? Yeah, it's uh, there's a um, there's again a spectrum that goes from repositioning to creating a new subcategory. And one of the uh, I just explained in my brand relevance book, one of the real issues is uh, uh, 
one of the mistakes you could make is to create a new subcategory when when there isn't really one there. The must have is not a must have. And uh, the other mistake, which is which is even bigger, is to fail to recognize you have a subcategory when you thought you just had an incremental innovation and was just making a minor repositioning decision. And you've lost the opportunity to, de to develop and own a whole new subcategory. So in both of those mistakes are easily made and in, in, it's, uh, it takes a lot of insight and research and so on to make sure you make the right one. Um, and, and so that's, again, why they play us the big bucks. Yeah, cool. I, I uh, that that's why we all have jobs. So there was a there was an early comment question. I had to do with the role of um, mobile technology. Dave, um, any thoughts on how um, the fact that people now have their communication device that's integral to their person on them at all times, how you see that as fitting into these three trends that you've talked about? Well, um, some, sometimes there, there are cases uh, in which uh, adding a mobile dimension to a brand and the brand experience and the brand uh, uh, purchase process in fact creates a new subcategory. Like for example, the Nike uh, you know, band, exercise band brand thing that... Oh, the fuel uh, band. Yeah, yeah. It, it really created a whole new subcategory, and it was based on mobile technology. And uh, so uh, th that's definitely one one case in which the the mobile app can actually create a whole new subcategory. Uh, and uh, a a another, and the yeah, mobile has has is making a huge impact. There's no question about it. And there's other cases in which mobile can support or enhance a new subcategory and become, um, you know, pivotal and, and point it off. Uh, yeah, it, it, it also seems as though it might strengthen the relationship between the individual and the individual consumer and the brand as well, right? In a sense, you now have the brand in your pocket. Yeah, no, yeah, absolutely. And, uh, and one of the reasons that the uh, uh, that, that just communicating your brand, your offering, and your firm is so often ineffective is because customers now have control of the communication channel. And so they're just not going to stand still for you imposing that kind of communication on them. Absolutely. Well, we, we have several more questions, but we are at the uh, we're in the last about four minutes of our time here today. So Dave, first of all, I would like to thank you so much. There were so many uh, comments about the insights that they've gotten in our in this 55 minutes, um, and they look forward to reading more about it in your book, and that is an awesome offer. I, I just think that that, that is uh, so thoughtful. And I'll just... Um, uh, Dave, can you just state your uh, email address one more time? Yeah, it's D Aker, D A A K E R, at profit, P R O P H E T dot com. Great. So, uh, Dave also maintains a blog, which I try to read regularly at uh, davidocker dot com. And um, just for those of you who like to know what's coming up next, our next webinar will be held on August 20th with John Gerzma, the CEO of BAV Consulting. We look forward to seeing you there or hearing you there. Many yeah, thanks. Yeah, he's asked John about energy. He's uh, really okay. has some data and, and opinions on brand energy and brand health over time. Oh, perfect. And many thanks to all of you for participating in our, web in our webinar series. So thanks a lot, and we'll see you next